as you know, welcome into what's new in the second edition of Access Technology for Blind and Low Vision Accessibility. Today, we're going to, after our introductions, we'll go through our objectives, we'll go through the presentation, we'll have our wrap up. This is for one CEU, uh, closed captioning is available. And please make sure you put your questions in the chat. Our presenter, Yu Ting Su from San Francisco State University, assistant professor. And our objectives today. So first we're gonna identify three strategies for utilizing the book. We're gonna examine two new philosophies of teaching blind and low vision students. We'll demonstrate how to use the book resources for advocating and assessing different student needs. And at this point, we are ready to turn it over to Ting. Thank you guys. Thank you APH for having me. Um, I'm so excited to be here talking about the book. Um, know that my hands are sweating because I see the participant numbers and I'm so happy that people made time for this this morning, so thank you. Um, I think in our current times, it's really important to focus on the silver linings. And I think one of my, one of the silver linings is this book talk right here, because I can imagine that, um, you know, um, I wouldn't have been able to, to speak to so many people normally because we had planned on doing this sort of book touring and book talking at conferences. And so I love that this is sort of an open source book talk and there's people from everywhere chiming in. Um, you can see the, the picture was a pre-pandemic pre haircut. Now I'm in post-pandemic days. My hair is super long right now, very different from the photo. And uh, you might be wondering where I am. I am in uh, our, our virtual coffee shop because this is a book talk. So I thought no better place to have it than, than a coffee shop. So we're going to just do a little, little coffee talk, I guess. Um, and let's see. Uh, I'm going to try and pace myself. I know there's a captioner, so um, thank you so much um, for, for doing the captions for us. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. All right, and uh, you know, just remembering you guys, this really is a, a book talk, so the, um, the slides are really just for visual aids for those who like to read, um, but I mean, you don't really need the visuals in this talk if you wanna step away and just listen, that's totally fine too. Um, really just imagine us, we're all in that coffee shop and uh, we're, we're just talking. Um, so number one thing about this book that I was really excited about, um, just the title uh, called Access Technology for Blind and Low Vision Accessibility. Um, who knew that the title itself would be such a back and forth. Um, it probably took us months to really land on a title that was agreeable. Um, this title was um, developed with a lot of feedback from the blindness community, from a lot of my, my blind techie friends. And with this book, we're trying to promote um, a pretty big shift in a philosophy of how we as um, sighted service providers need to be better allies to the blindness communities and really empower students um, for true participation in their, their local communities. Um, so uh, for, uh, oh, I should probably introduce myself. Um, um, as, as Paul said, I, my name's Ting Su and I coordinate the TVI program at San Francisco State. Um, I'm also a teacher of blind and low vision students, um, O&M um, specialist, and I'm still in the field one day a week, which you know, despite all my love for teacher prep and teacher training, uh, that day in the field is still my favorite day of the week all the time. Um, so it continues to inform a lot of my practice and my research. And um, with this book, I was really happy to, it was pretty much a brain dump of just uh, dumping my TVI brain into a book about technology um, with the help of a very vibrant community. So I do wanna say that the book would not have been possible with a lot of my friends and colleagues in the field um, with whom I've been collaborating for many, many years. Um, if you guys wanted to read a little bit more about kind of my background, um, my website's on the slide here. It's www tplus.education and also for anybody possibly uh, interested in a TVI program or want to refer somebody uh, you also can find out more information about our SF State San Francisco State TVI program at viprogram.sfsu.edu. Okay 
three. All right, so um, let's kick us off. So the purpose of the book, um, as mentioned, it's really shifting that philosophy. So here um, on the left side of the slide, uh, we've got a little cartoon graphic that uh, we were actually able to commission from an artist, Cass Freyer. And uh, in this graphic, it's a teacher and a student, they're jumping up and down, they're waving their hands in the air, and they're both shouting, it's new tech day, it's new tech day. And this is the, the, the level of excitement I wanted to bring to our field about technology. Um, I know that technology can make a lot of people nervous, I'm sure. It's definitely probably retired to several people. Um, and, you know, even for somebody like myself, who's I'm, I'm pretty much, a, I still consider myself very much an amateur tech geek, it's a lot to keep up with. Um, but I think despite any of our anxieties or uncertainty about technology, we have to put that aside and convey excitement about technology to our students. Um, because technology for blind and low vision students is different than for other students. Um, it's not an option. It's, it's not a if, if you want, but technology really facilitates information um, in ways that is not possible without technology for many of our students. So the number one purpose of the book is um, the idea of shifting um, from assistive to access. And by really emphasizing the word access, we are able to emphasize the role of technology for blind and low vision individuals. And that is facilitating access to information. So if we think about technology facilitating access to information, then what is our role as service providers? Service providers meaning um, teachers, educators, uh, you know, professors, AT specialists, all of, the, all of the demographic that's represented in this group today. Um, really at the beginning and end of the, of the day, we are accessibility facilitators. Our job is to fac facilitate our students um, or clients access to information um, that will then provide access to education, entertainment, employment. Um, so all of that really um, is centered on access. And I like this premise because with the word assistive, there's some sort of like dependency or, or deficit associated with that word. Um, and you know, we're, we're, we're bridging the terms now because uh, legally, assistive is still in the, the legal language in IDEA or Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, so it is still, it's totally okay to use both terms, um, but philosophically speaking, I think access technology um, gives a broader umbrella that talks about all the technologies um, that wrap up under that. And so the other idea of thinking about access rather than assistive technology is that it ultimately empowers the student. It puts the student in the driver's seat for how and when and with what they wanna access information. Um, I think one of the big shifts from the first edition to this edition is in the first edition, there was a lot of language about how do we get the students buy-in? And you know, when Ike and I were updating from the first edition, um, there was always this talk of, well, how, how do we write about how do we get students buy-in? And I actually, um, ultimately, in the final year of revisions, um, I, I kind of conceded the floor to me, and he said, go ahead, Tim, just, just fly with this. And so um, I ended up actually taking out all the parts of a buy-in because I think if we approach technology in this way of uh, facilitating one's access to information, um, that empowerment idea, it, it negates the, the need for having to, to focus on buy-in or to worry about that because um, we're empowering the student by involving the students in their initial um, choice or experimentation with technology, experimentation with different ways to, to leverage their access. And ultimately, it's the student's choice what they want to use, when, and how. Um, I think another shift from assisted to access is that it does help empower the school team because now we're no longer talking about assistive technology for quote unquote special ed, but we're talking about access technology that makes engagement with information more interesting for everybody in the classroom. So, you know, there's always many students in the classroom who can benefit from text to speech, not just our blind and low vision students, um, especially now when um, these poor children are 
um, you know, being or facing six hours of school Zoom days, which is just mind blowing to me and bananas that this would be allowed. Um, I think more and more students are going to need that break from screen time. So we're going to find that um, you know, especially for those teachers of blind and low vision students working in schools, that we're going to be very uniquely situated to work with our school teams to brainstorm different ways that students can engage with information. And by ensuring that it's accessible, it's really going to, it's going to bring everybody up in the classroom, which I think is really cool. Okay, so uh, I know I feel like I have a little bit of my professor hat on here because I'm talking about terms and words. And, um, you know, there is something about the power of language, or is there? Is it just semantics? Um, I have to admit, when I, uh, you know, before PhD school, um, I really thought it was just about semantics. Um, specifically, I, I remember Kay Holbrook talking about the difference between evaluation and assessment. And I thought, does that really matter? Are we just arguing words here? But there is power in words. And I think there is something beyond just semantics. So. Um, Thank you, Kay Holbrook, for, for initially challenging my thoughts there. And I always think of, of Kay Holbrook when, we, when talking about terminology. Um, so another shift from you know, assisted to access, and now we've got from person first to identity first. Um, this is a big one, especially for those of us in the room here um, who are sighted practitioners. Um, you know, I think one of the very exciting takeaways from the trials and tribulations from the last couple of years, um, kind of politically, is that I think there's been a, a better awareness of what does being an ally mean to a population maybe that's been disenfranchised. And um, this idea of how people identify with their disability is um, a really great example of that. So, you know, as coming up in education and in my teacher training programs, working with mostly sighted practitioners, um, we get hit on the head with person-first language. So it's a student with, um, it's a student who has. Um, but I think in recent years, there's been a pretty strong outcry from the disability community to say, no, this is how we want to identify. And so I think it's very important that, especially when we're supporting students whose membership is truly with a community that might be different from ours as the sighted practitioners, it's important to recognize um, how communities want to identify. So um, I wanna challenge everybody here to think about how we can be respectful of how um, you know, the blind community might identify or how might some other people with low vision um, might identify and to respect that. Um, just so you guys know, there have been an updates in our academic um, kind of language. So we, we follow you know, the APA manual. It's like the manual that dictates uh, formalities in writing. And with this new edition that was just published this spring, it recognizes disability first or identi identity. Oh, identity first. Oh my gosh, there's a typo on my slide. Identity first language for the first time ever. Um, so I wanted to share a couple quotes in the book um, to better understand what we're talking about here, um, because disability is very much an identity piece, very similar to one's identification with gender or culture. Um, and so let's go through a couple um, quotes here. So this is from page three in the introduction. And um, you know, when we think about our language, we have a way to engage the individual as an active agent in his or her own life and celebrate diversity rather than perpetuating notions of deficit. So this is a, you know, I wrote this because in connecting with my peers in the blindness and disability communities, you know, the idea of identifying as I am blind or I am capital B blind this is an identity that people are proud of. And it's an identity where if you can find pride in that, um, that community, then it actually opens up a lot of options for engagement and empowerment, uh, finding resources that are needed. I know that when I work with my middle school low vision students, you know, when I first started working with, um, I have two middle school students, and of course, being middle schoolers with low vision, they're hugely embarrassed about their visual impairment. 
And, you know, we started talking about how do I even talk about my visual impairment? And I think in the beginning, it was like, oh, I have bad vision, I have terrible vision. Um, I just have the worst vision. Um, but we started, I started challenging them and saying, what about saying, yeah, I've got low vision, so what? I've got low vision, I have to use these tools, so what? It's not a, no biggie, I just have low vision. And I, I think helping them figure out their identity in, um, as a person who has a visual impairment, um, it was a bit of a coming to age thing now too. Um, uh, so that was, that was a really interesting thing for me to experience last year with my middle school students, just helping them work through that identity piece. Um, okay, here's another quote from the book. Um, and this is actually a quote taken from another um, author, uh, Bruegeman, 2013. And that is, claiming disability means valuing disability, and it empowers a disabled person to choose his or her own identity. Um, and I think this is just another uh, plug for, you know, let's value the di diversity that comes from uh, disability and to really honor how people who have disabilities want to identify. If this would be a time just to, uh, just to pause for a moment, in mm -hmm. talking about this terminology, it is really making myself think too. I'm generalizing it to so many other different situations it's such a timely thing to discuss, but just curious. So the title of the book uses yeah. the terminology um, that veering away from using the term visually impaired. So inside in the book, what um, is there that umbrella term that is still used within the book visually impaired, or is there anything that you might be able to share about that? Yeah, and so I think just as we've got one foot in assistive and another foot in access technology, same goes for person first and identity first language. Um, I think it's just fine to, to use a little bit of both. And I think it ultimately comes down to uh, what people are comfortable with. And, um, you know, as long as we can ultimately defer to how those from the blindness or low vision communities want to identify, um, you know, your students might have different preferences. Um, so I think it's just fine to use either and, you know, you'll find that in the book, I do go between referring to a blind or low vision individual or, you know, individuals with visual impairments. It's, it's all pretty mixed in there. Um, so, yeah, does that answer the question? Yes, ma'am. That was great. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, keep the questions coming and uh, thank you for, for asking that. Okay, so... You know, some, this is a lot of practice. Um, I probably, I remember when I first started adjunct lecturing at SF State and I was very much, you must use person first language and you will get points off your paper if you do not do so. Um, and it's really shifted now in the past seven years and it's taken seven years of my own work, um, you know, with the disability committee to better understand um, any ableist assumptions I'm bringing into my practice to address my ableist assumptions and to work on understanding what it, again, what it means to be an ally. And I think this sort of self-reflection work, um, you know, is, is relevant for a lot of areas of our cultural practices. Um, <clears throat> so sometimes people, you know, it, it is a process. And so I thought I'd share one last quote about this. Uh, so just as ethnicity or gender is encapsulated within one's identity, so is disability. So identity first language is ultimately a rally cry against ableist assumptions that perceive disability as a deficit that requires compensatory grammar. And this is ultimately the thing of really understanding how our words convey the philosophy that we align with. Okay. All right. Um, so it's a work in progress, you guys. And this is really just the beginning of a much larger and probably lifelong uh, conversation and internal work. So it's just the beginning. Uh, know that there is something called the preamble of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, I often reference this preamble in trainings and in some of my class lectures at San Francisco State. Uh, what this preamble does is it situates the cause of disability in a community's prejudices about disabled people. 
and poorly designed environments that exclude rather than include disabled individuals. In essence, this preamble states that contextual factors rather than a diagnosis are what disable a person. And this is where I get really excited about what technology brings to the table. Because technology, um, you know, if you talk about like web design or learning management systems or those, um, you know, online curriculum, all of our virtual classroom things that we're really having to deal with head on now, the design of those virtual learning platforms and environments can totally include all of our students, including our blind and low vision students, or it could totally exclude them. The same way a set of stairs can, or versus a ramp, can include or exclude somebody from entering a building. Um, it's the same thing here, except we're really looking at virtual environments um, versus physical environments. And um, it's when those barriers, those environmental and attitudinal barriers are in place that truly, you know, quote unquote, disables the person, okay? Um, so I, I like this because it moves, it shifts the responsibility for access to more of a community um, effort. Okay, and, um, oh, just one, another quote about moving from assisted to access. Uh, the environmental barriers to print and digital information for blind and visually impaired people can be broken down not so much by quote unquote assisting the individual but by ensuring accessible environments and appropriate tools and training are available to ensure a person's equitable access to information. Okay so just to review um, access means that we can now better empower the technology user. Access also means facilitating one's membership in one's community. So I think a lot of um, <clears throat> practitioners who've been in the field, you know, the emphasis is always on access to, like, how do I read this text? How do I read this book? Um, how do I uh, read the board? How do I see the board? Um, but in order to facilitate membership, yes, we have to ensure access to the information, but we also have to ensure engagement with the information. So now um, we have to better situate our student as a recipient of information just as much as a creator of information. So another neat shift in the book is that there's as much emphasis on tools for ac um, accessing information with you know, blind, uh, low vision or non-visual tools, um, but there's also thinking about tools that blind people can use to create information themselves. And so uh, when we make sure that every student in a room is equally engaged, that places the student um, with equitable access to leadership opportunities in their classroom. And, um, you know, I think every student is just as much entitled to leadership as they are entitled to accessing all the information in their learning environment. Um, because we know that those who have access to information are those who have power. And so this idea of empowering our blind and low vision students is very important because they need to develop that sense of entitlement that will carry them through school and college and employment if that's their path. Or if it's another student who will require some sort of um, assistance um, or support system um, throughout their life, then um, teaching that student how to be in charge of how they dictate the assistance they require. Okay, uh, one of my really good friends and highly respected colleagues, Chansey Fleet, um, she's a blind assistive technology um, coordinator at the New York Public Library. And I really like this quote. This is taken from the forward. So Chansey, I invited Chansey to author the forward to the book. And um, in it, she says, we, and she's uh, representing, you know, we, me as a blind person, we need professionals and parents to model a positive, resilient, and inquiring approach to technology. We should learn that the question, is this accessible, is a dead-end question. How can I access this works better? We should be encouraged to cultivate our problem-solving and improvisational skills. We need to get comfortable with troubleshooting, doing research, switching platforms, and trial and error to become resilient users of technology. And I, I think this basically lays out our tasks for the service providers in this room today. Um, it is our job to cultivate our students to problem solve and improvise. 
Um, you know, all of you who have worked with technology, we know that the most reliable thing about technology is that it will and does fail you. And while, of course, when technology fails, especially during a student lesson, you know, you're like sweating bullets and your, you know, your armpits get a little clammy and you're just like, oh my gosh, how am I going to get through this lesson? Things aren't working, um, you know, disaster is impending. Um, but I think in those moments, it's important to take a pause and remember that troubleshooting through a technology issue is in itself a huge learning um, opportunity. So um, students should be right there next to us when we are trying to problem solve something or when something doesn't work and we need to improvise a solution um, and we're trying to figure out what's a workaround or what's my backup technology. Um, students absolutely should be right there involved um, with us when we're doing that. Um, you know, as students get savvier with their skills or even, um, you know, doing basic skills, doing that research to figure out what is the answer to the, this problem or how do I solve this problem or what are the workarounds? Um, students can also be engaged in that research. Um, you know, it takes some of the pressure off of us, but it also prepares them for the future. Um, this idea of teaching students how to switch platforms and have fluency and um, resilience in using different types of technology, I think is also huge. Um, this means that, you know, just as well as, you know, we need to switch between using like uh, Chrome or Firefox or pulling out different devices to do different things, our students need that same sort of fluidity and proficiency in using different types of technology. Hey, before you move on, here's another quick question. We have some great discussion going on in the chat box. You have really got us thinking a lot, um, especially talking about the, going back, certainly back to the semantics. And so do you have from, you know, being an educator, that perspective, going to the, th the notion that, uh, that when children are very, very young, those are the term, whatever terms we're using to describe them or identify them tends to be what grows with them. And do you have suggestions about how uh, educators can best model that use of language? And I think this is perhaps going back to, you know, the terms of low vision or blind, visually impaired. That's, do you have any suggestions that you might be able to offer? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, I think the biggest sort of challenge to person first language, like, oh, this is a child who is blind, is that you're tiptoeing around the, the word blind. And when you're tiptoeing around the word blind, there is no pride in the word blind. And um, part of taking back that word um, within the community, I think is taking back the power um, that is taken away when you're tiptoeing around that word. Um, I, I am not the best person to answer this question because um, I would definitely want to defer to somebody or, or several people in the blindness community who can better speak to that. But the way I try to think about it um, as somebody who's working on this is if you think about how, you know, blindness or disability would be a gender or cultural identity, it's sort of like I identify as an Asian American female. I wouldn't say that I am a person with femaleness or a person with Asian Americanness. So if you kind of equate it to something that is more gender or culture or uh, culturally familiar, um, you can do a little bit of wordplay um, in that way. Thank you very much. Sure. And yeah, you guys, it's okay to be uncomfortable with this. Um, it's something that we just have to be aware of and, and work on. And I think this is definitely, uh, you know, another plug um, to check in with the blindness community or check in with other uh, people who've got low vision. And, you know, I think that the importance of having blind mentors or role models are, are huge for our students because um, no matter how tech savvy you are, if you are a sighted practitioner, there's a limit to what you can pass on to the student either with skills and technology proficiency but also just philosophy with identifying and empowering yourself um, ultimately that's got to come from the disability community that the student is part of okay so great question thank you um, for that amy 
Okay, so and we talked a lot about philosophy. So I'm sure that the the burning question here is what's new in AT? Um, so you know, just a couple things from 2009. Um, it's just been 10 years since the last edition. Um, just a few updates in technology have happened in our in in the world. <laughs> So um, one really interesting thing about the book is that we talk about mainstream features, we talk about mainstream options, um, we talk about the greater diversity in the specialized assistive technology options. Um, there's also greater availability of specialized options now and really like I gotta give like double thumbs up to APH here. Um, it blows me away the range of tech that's now available from APH. I mean, you guys have really helped bridge this gap in accessing um, technology for our students. Um, so there's really no excuse for our students not to have some introductory devices at the very least um, to get them started. Um, and finally, you know, technology is so ubiquitous now that there's a real integration of specialized and mainstream tech. Um, there's almost no dividing line uh, between what specialized and mainstream tech is because mainstream tech now offers so many different options for different ways uh, uh, to engage with information. And a lot of the specialized assistive technology, they're taking hints from mainstream tech and integrating that. So um, innovations have really gone both ways, which is really cool. So one thing about the book is that I really emphasize being device agnostic. And any of my SS State students who are listening in, you're probably like, oh, there she goes. She gave me points off when I identified a brand name device. And yeah, it's not about the brand names anymore, you guys. It's about what features of technology are available and what features of technology does my student need? Because when you talk about features of tech, you open up a world of brainstorming um, what's available and what possibly, what's, what tools could solve the problem. Um, I have to say that when I, this is probably about um, seven or eight years ago, um, I was a TVI in, this, in a Bay Area district and I was really struggling with my low vision student because, you know, we were looking at the CCT, CCTV options, but I wanted to have a camera where he could point to a paper on his desk and then point to the cat, put the camera at the board. And, you know, I always make a point of um, being very close in close collaboration with the IT specialist or the IT director uh, in this case. And so I remember walking into the IT director's office and being like, Tracy, I'm just struggling here. I need a student who needs to be able to see the, his papers larger. Um, I need him to be able to you know, very quickly enlarge the papers, maybe on a screen, but then I also, he needs to see the board, he can't see the board, and describing all the needs he had for what he needed to do, so very task-oriented. And in my head, I mean, it was just all about CCTVs back then, and she went, well, what about this document camera? This document camera connects wirelessly, you can connect it to any type of screen, you can flip the camera up and down, and that's when I was introduced to um, the original IPVO document camera. And now I think it's become a lot more common to use document cameras as a video magnifier for our students. And um, I would have never discovered this um, solution had I really focused just on CCTVs, you know? And the IT director would have never been able to help me really brainstorm a solution. And we'd have, we would have, we'd have never landed on this mainstream solution. Um, had I just been in this lane of specialized technology and just looking at CCTVs. Um, now, I mean, do I, am I saying that there's no room for specialized devices? Absolutely not. I'm just saying that we now have just greater options, okay? Um, and then, you know, the next thing, it comes down to uh, what is a personal computing device? You know, people ask me all the time, uh, what kind of a computer should I get my student? Or, you know, what, what, sort of which, which type of note taker um, should I purchase for a student? And, you know, it's, it's about what does the student need to do? What do they need to accomplish? And what does a personal computing device mean to a student? I mean, honestly, for me, sometimes my personal computing device is my smartphone um, because we have so many different options for what's a personal computing device now and so many different ways of accomplishing the same tasks. 
So I'd like to pause here for a quick poll because I'm curious to know. I want you guys to take a minute and reflect here from the time you woke up to the time you logged into this webinar, how many devices have you touched today? And so I have launched the poll. You should have access to it, um, showing how many devices have you touched today? Maybe just one, two, three, maybe five or more. Stop and think and reflect for a moment of just how many different devices you may have touched today. The numbers are coming in and we are almost up to 50% reporting. Let it go for just a minute. There's still responses coming in. Ooh, okay, I'm going to just for the sake of time, I'm gonna end the polling. I'm gonna share the results so that you all can see. So just how many devices have you touched today? We had uh, 47 attendees, that makes up 36%, say that they touched three devices. So interesting in looking down that 20% touched five or more devices. Incredible, and I see in the chat, we have Amanda Stein who touched nine devices. That's so cool. Um, so, you know, the other day um, <clears throat> I was doing another presentation and I asked the crowd, um, you know, think about what do you guys use to send a message? What are the different ways you could send a message? And there's a whole flurry of input in the chat box about, you know, oh, I use iMessage, you know, WhatsApp, WeChat, Facebook, blah, 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 blah. And there are all these different apps and devices that people use to send a message. And I think that speaks volumes in that we really need to focus on what task it is that a student must accomplish to figure out then what technology is going to be the best fit for that student. So, you know, it's, it's a, a different way of thinking how to develop students' proficiency in this. Um, and let's see. Um, so, you know, the number one thing is assessing the situation. Um, so when figuring out what are all those devices that the student needs, um, well, number one, it's pretty much um, inferred there that students need multiple devices, okay? Um, I know that there's usually a kind of a tradition of, oh, the, the VI student only gets one device. Well, you know, that's really not gonna cut it anymore because um, at a minimum, you need two because you need maybe your primary and then you need a backup. Um, but again, think about all the devices that you guys have touched today. And our blind and low vision students are entitled to that same um, privilege of choice, okay? Um, so assessment considerations. Number one is to evaluate the current user experience. I think for anybody who's got any experience um, doing an assessment with students, you have to do lots of observations and you have to understand what is the current situation. And part of understanding what the current user experience is, is identifying well, what's working really well and what's not working really well. So in the book, there's a needs assessment template that takes people through this process of evaluating what's working well and what's not, and identifying um, those high impact areas for intervention where maybe the student is always relying on sighted assistance. So this may, might be like a high impact area um, to design an intervention because it's going to have um, the most kind of positive uh, benefit for the student. Um, so part of that, you know, you're evaluating the current user experience, you're identifying the needs for how to optimize the user experience. Um, so optimizing meaning, again, um, maybe identify those areas of dependency. And if a student wants more independence in that area, great. It might be um, seeing how a student can be more efficient in either accessing or completing their work, um, figuring out opportunities for leadership as well. And then finally, figuring out, okay, now that I know what the needs are, how can I implement those interventions to now optimize the user experience? So you'll see um, that in part two of the book, um, each chapter kind of goes through each step of this evaluation, identification, and implementation of um, technology-focused interventions. 
Um, so sorry, I skipped ahead a little bit. Um, but in part one of the book, um, it goes through, it provides an overview of available and emerging technologies. So the chapters are organized by tasks because again, when we think about technologies, uh, we're gonna be driven by the task. So there's a chapter on accessing print media, and then there's accessing digital text, and then there's offering. And this is a word um, that I am really happy that we updated to using authoring, because authoring includes drafting, reading back, revising, and authoring is not just writing for yourself like a journal entry because you know um, you guys all know if you're taking a note for yourself it just has to be readable to yourself uh, but when you're authoring um, you're authoring for somebody else to read your work and so there's a different um, I think there's different expectations when you talk about authoring versus simply just writing um, and again situates that individual in that position of creating information for others' consumption. Uh, there's also a chapter on producing alternate media. And then finally, accessing multimedia and data. And this, this last chapter on accessing multimedia data, this is an area that I totally love nerding out about. Um, because especially now in our digital um, world, there's a lot of text, images, and videos that are all in multimedia formats that can be very exciting and interesting, um, but there's also a lot of accessibility considerations involved there. Um, so this is a chapter where I talk um, a lot about the emerging technologies, but also with a grain of salt. So what's the, what are the grains of salt that we need to consider when we read about some sort of new or emerging technology, or when that researcher reaches out to you and you're like, they're like, we solved the problem of, you know, X, Y, and Z technology. And, you know, I, I hate to be that Debbie Downer person who's like, I don't think it's gonna work, but we have to be critical thinkers about um, how technology is designed, how digital and virtual learning environments are designed um, with considerations for what blind and low vision students need. And with that, we have to teach our students how to think critically about technologies and evaluate um, what you know, limitations, constraints, or advantages of different technologies will offer the students too. Okay, so from um, part one of the book, you know, again, it's just that overview of what's around. And then part two is offering that conceptual and practical framework for um, assessing students' needs. So um, the way the book is written is, you know, you've got the thinking piece of how do I evaluate assessment needs or technology needs, but then if you're not, if you can identify, okay, a student needs this type of feature of technology. So let's say a student needs to access printed text non-visually. So we've got a totally blind learner maybe, you have some print, and you see that this totally blind learner is not accessing this print media very efficiently, you can then go back to the chapter on accessing print media and read about all the different technologies that are available there so that you can use part two to identify the problem and then part one to look at, I guess, the different ingredients and go shopping for what ingredients might fit into that need, if that makes sense. Um, so the criteria determine if a student should use a generalized device or a dedicated device. I think it really comes back to figuring out what is it the student needs to do, um, you know, and also figuring out where is the student going. 100% um, every single blind and low vision student should have strong keyboarding skills going into third grade because third grade is when students are testing on the computer. Um, even though school districts might not be officially teaching keyboarding until, you know, second or third grade, our students might need that introduction to the keyboard way earlier, like kindergarten, first grade, second grade. So they're going into third grade knowing the keyboard um, because whether a student is going to be using a, something specialized like a braille note taker, um, students still need to have computer proficiency. Um, I, I can't overemphasize the need for computer proficiency. So, you know, then it might be thinking about, okay, well, if a student's using a note taker and using, you know, six key braille entry, where and how can I carve out opportunities for them to also be practicing keyboarding and working on a computer? 
Um, and this is not an easy process. Um, you know, I went through it this, this summer when I was um, working summer school with a totally blind academic student going to second grade. And, you know, we're working through all the tech that's available, um, working through iPad, Braille display, laptop, do we go note taker? Um, and so the way I left the summer was, let's identify a couple of different workflows. So, you know, for a second grader, okay, what's, what are his workflows for um, reading a book? What are his workflows for making a journal entry? Um, what are his workflows for like reading the, the class, um, you know, activities for that week. And within each workflow, uh, we, we then identified, okay, well, what's the, what are the technologies that are going to line up that he's going to use for that workflow? So there's basically a couple of different tasks that we've highlighted and identify the technology that's going to go with it. So, um, you know, how did I figure this out? Well, it is a little bit of experience, um, but with the book, um, we have a rich collection of forms, appendices, and sidebars there. So um, the forms are just kind of templates that you can personalize or you can just fill out as is. So a lot of these forms will help you figure out, okay, what's the infrastructure for technology in this district? Um, what are the needs of the student? Um, what are the different areas that I can evaluate? And there isn't one single AT evaluation form. I mean, there's actually one giant one that evaluates all areas of um, technology needs, but then there's also different types of evaluation templates. And it's all about which template suits your needs. Um, what template is gonna give you the information that you need? because ultimately these templates are just a way to organize the information, okay? Um, and then uh, the appendices are just kind of extra information about certain laws related to accessibility and advocacy. And then there's a couple of sidebars that are pretty interesting too. And so there's our, you know, kind of like mini bird walks from the regular chapter um, that give a little bit more in-depth training. Um, and uh, so, uh, let's see. Yeah, sorry, I'm just reading the chat here. And yeah, I, I understand it is 60 minutes and don't worry guys, we are close to wrapping up. Um, so remember that these templates merely are just a starting point um, to make sure that you do cover all those considerations. Um, and then for any of those people who are interested in how might I carry out a comprehensive technology evaluation that fits into a larger comprehensive functional vision assessment, learning media assessment, ECC, um, there's a webinar um, that I did with uh, the California School for the Blind. Uh, it talks about how might I go about doing a comprehensive FBLMTA so that I can then link the technology um, to the FBA and LMA. So you can find that webinar on the SF State VI Programs YouTube channel as well as the CSB uh, YouTube channel. And we are in the beginnings of developing a template for how do I craft this comprehensive FVLMTA. Um, it's a pretty involved process, but um, there is a template for um, how you would put together this report anyway. So if you follow the template, uh, it gives, it's pretty open for you to pop in whatever information and it's meant to be open so that you can really customize it to capturing the needs of your different students. Okay. So in the final minutes of our webinar, we've got eight minutes left, you guys. Um, I just wanted to touch on instructional considerations. Um, you know, remembering that this is really a more general book talk to cover like what's in the book. Um, this is an area that, I mean, this in itself could be its own half day, full day workshop, you know? Um, so chapter 10 of the book is all about how to scale up students' digital literacy skills. Because remember, if we are expecting our students to have that same sort of fluency across multiple devices, we need to nurture that, okay? So uh, this is one of my favorite graphics. Um, I, some of you might have probably seen this already, but this is a technology learning curve that I found online and I contacted the author, uh, Sasha Casper, about it. And he was super excited that this graphic was gonna be used. Uh, I don't think he has any idea how much I've been, uh, <laughs> this graphic would be used, but essentially this is a line graph with X axis uh, labeled time, Y axis labeled experience, 
and there's a couple of peaks and dips in the line graph and basically you know when you first start um, playing with technology you're playing with it because there's that immediate curve upwards and you're like oh this looks like fun and um, you know for our students this is when they're playing around with how can I listen to information or what device does this or how did how does this device work and how does this like put out auditory information how does this put out tactile information or how does this like allow me to adjust my uh, low vision features for better access here and so you're like oh this is cool this is fun i'm just playing around with different features not doing much but i'm just playing around which is i think is a big emphasis here and this can happen as early as kindergarten or first grade and essentially what we're doing here is we're getting students excited about the different ways they can access information. Oh, I can, I can see it, I can hear it, I can, you know, I can feel it. Um, and you're getting excited about the different sensory modalities. And then once you start wanting technology to, to do something, you might run into some snags and that's when you're like, oh, this is kind of hard. But then you keep playing. And the idea again is you're playing. And you're like, hey, I have no idea what I'm doing, but whatever button I push, it's working and I'm gonna keep doing it. So now that, that technology learning curve is rising again. And then you get to the point where you're like, oh yes, I get it. I think I know what's going on with this piece of tech. And then you hit some snags and this is where troubleshooting comes into play. And you're like, oh, maybe I don't get it. Oh, maybe I don't know my stuff. But you keep playing, you troubleshoot. And then finally you have this final upward trend of technology learning where you're like, okay, this is making sense. Now that I've played with different ways of seeing, hearing, touching information, now that I've played around with what different types of tech or apps, what they can do or what they can't do, now I can put it to work. Now I can see, well, okay, if I could read a recipe using this tool or feature, how might I apply that to reading a book or reading um, a handout that was given to me? So now we're applying that play-based knowledge, that discovery knowledge to working tasks. Um, and that's exactly um, kind of how we can help our students develop those digital literacy skills. Um, so essentially, you know, I kind of summarize this in four steps in the book, but step one is to introduce technology as soon as possible. But remember, only incidentally and only for fun. And a lot of this early introduction is modeling how technology is used. So think about you know, your sighted toddlers who are watching parents dial, dial a, a phone number or a person because we're not dialing phone numbers anymore, we're dialing a contact, right? And so if you've got a blind toddler in the room, they need to be hearing voiceover and how you're actually navigating a system to dial a, a person and not a number. Um, so some of this is also, you know, working with parents to make sure parents can at least turn on and off a screen reader or turn it on and off like talk back on their Android device or voiceover on their iPhone so that students get used to hearing how information is working. And these are very early, again, incidental introductions to technology. You know, students in the classroom, they can see how their teacher goes and hits print and prints out a, a piece of paper. And for our students who are going to be screen reader users, they need to have that sort of same sort of modeling of, oh, I hear the screen reader going through these different menus, and now I'm learning how you print out a piece of paper, okay? So finding opportunities to ensure these incidental access points um, are really important. Number two, again, is developing student sensory learning channels when they're playing with tech. And again, it's all about play, 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 play whether it's just turning on a screen reader so that the kid can hit a, a key on the keyboard and they hear it, or um, there's the, the learn keys program that we used to turn on, um, or just unplugging the QWERTY keyboard and letting the student play with the keyboard and begin learning where the keys are and you know just not even having to look but feeling where the bumps are. Uh, remembering that students are multimodal learners and ultimately we are preparing students to on demand decide how and with what they want to access information. And then as students are playing, this is when we can use our diagnostic skills to figure out, okay, do we need to do a little bit more work on developing those little fine motor finger skills? Um, are the students having difficulty with gestures 
or coordinating their little fingers? Do I need to actually work on developing students' listening skills? So, you know, with my student over the summer, great listening skills because he's a non-visual learner, but he wasn't actually listening to details that a screen reader was giving him. So even though he was naturally an auditory learner, he still needed a little bit of ear training there. And then finally, like orientation. What does orientation mean in the virtual environment? What are these concepts of right and left or top of document or top of screen and bottom of the screen? Um, so rethinking, like how do I build students' conceptual understanding of the visual space and how do I build mental maps for the student? And then finally, remembering that after you've done all this playing, then you can introduce a work-like task. Um, and again, it's work-like, but it's still fun. So how do I read that recipe? How might I message a friend of mine through the messaging app? And then once students get fluent in that, that's when you can apply technology to a more high stakes thing like testing or homework. So I know with a lot of this, it seems overwhelming with the amount of technology to keep up. Um, and this is where having that community of practice is really important. Um, a few years ago, I did a large scale study. It involved over 500 TBIs. And we got very strong, significantly, statistically significant data um, that those TBIs who identified with a community of practice, so had people that they could go to with technology questions and basically like have that water cooler talk about technology. Those are the TVIs who can both develop and keep up their assistive technology proficiency. Um, so that's part of why you guys are all here. Um, thanks again for coming. Um, this is really part of building your own community of practice and keeping up with your own technology proficiency. Um, so I think everybody here is already well on their way to having that community of practice with technology. And I just want to leave you again with the graphic of it's new tech day so we can get all excited about technology and the new school year. And of course, always looking for all those different opportunities um, that are just going to open up the digital and physical worlds to our students. Um, so here, if you guys want to find me, I'm on social media at TBI underscore Ting on Facebook and YouTube as well. And our San Francisco State VI program is also on all the social medias, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, so. Thank you so much, Ting. I love your enthusiasm and the knowledge that you gave us today. I took back with me so much um, new information and new things to think about. And I love the idea and the emphasis of making it fun. So just wanted to say thank you for taking that time to share and for everyone staying with us.